So uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening uh, from where you are connecting with us in the, the globe. And uh, thank you very much for the colleagues that took the time to, to register and to actually attend this uh, webinar. As uh, some of you might already be familiar, we call this uh, Knowledge Dissemination Dialogues on Webinars. It's a series of webinars co-organized by the AMR Working Group of FAO and the FAO Sustainable Livestock Technical Network, uh, where we promote different colleagues' work. Um, and at the end, we call it dialogue because we like to leave a lot of time for the discussion and uh, potentially open new doors for collaborations um, between the speakers, FAO, the colleagues attending, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, today, we have the pleasure of having our colleague, Peter Tamborg. Uh, is based in Denmark, and he will be presenting some of the work that he has been doing in Denmark and with a network called Enovat. And the topic will be optimizing veterinary antibiotic use through development of treatment guidelines and clinical breakpoints. Just a um, couple of housekeeping rules. Please keep your microphone on mute. If needed, rename yourself with your organization and country, followed by your name uh, in the name of the, the Zoom participant. Please note that the views presented are those of the speakers and not uh, necessarily endorsed by FAO. Please refrain from advertising your services, your company, or any other commercial product or brand. And please post your questions in the chat. At the end, we will read them out. And if it's not possible to answer all of them during the webinar today, we'll follow up uh, by email afterwards. A quick note that the meeting is being recorded and that the video and the PowerPoint presentations will be posted on the FAO YouTube channel and shared with the participants. So with this said, um, I stop here. Thank you all. And the floor is yours, Peter. OK, uh, thank you, George. I will try to share my screen. Hopefully, it will work. OK, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, uh, yes, uh, I have the, the title here, Optimizing Veterinary Antibiotic Use Through Development of Treatment Guidelines and cl Clinical Breakpoints, as uh, George said. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here today to, to present some of the, the work that uh, I and a lot of colleagues have been doing as part of the, the Innovat Network. I'm from the uh, University of Copenhagen and Associate Professor in Veterinary Clinical Microbiology. So what I will talk about uh, will be first an introduction to, to Enovat, to this uh, network that uh, George also mentioned, uh, because it's, uh, you can say, the frame for a lot of the work we have been doing on, on treatment guidelines, uh, and also to some extent the clinical breakpoints that I will talk about afterwards. And it will not just be the actual work on, on treatment guidelines and clinical breakpoints, but also some of the issues pertaining to that, to development of how to, to do it, and also uh, some of the issues and some of the problems of, of doing it. And then, of course, afterwards, I'll be happy to take uh, any questions you, you may have. So ENOVAT is an abbreviation, an acronym for the European Network for Optimization of Veterinary Antimicrobial Treatment. It's a cost action network funded by COST, which is uh, also known as the European Corporation in Science and Technology. So it's a EU funded uh, networking. And what is funded is uh, various networking activities, including meetings, workshops, training schools, short-term scientific missions where uh, particularly young researchers can travel to other labs or other scientific environments, to, to learn new methods and, and use uh, and, and um, do something for, for Innovat. And then also funding for dissemination activities, including uh, publication fees, uh, web page, uh, press releases, and, and so on. So it's all about networking and uh, no money for research. So that has to be uh, attracted uh, from other channels. Quite often it's existing uh, research being done already in the different labs uh, or different in, uh, research environments that is being, you can say, uh, put into a, a higher frame with this uh, a cost action network. Currently, we have more than 260 persons from 45 countries attending Innovat. And here you can see a map of the Innovat consortium. 
you can see uh, most of Europe is covered. Um, all the countries in green are what is known as cost countries. Some of them are light green, uh, known as near neighbor countries. A lot of uh, different uh, definitions that I will not go into too much detail about, but you can see most of Europe uh, is covered at, at the moment. Uh, and the people included uh, are microbiologists, pharmacologists, veterinary practitioners, epidemiologists, we have some communication experts, uh, and so on. Uh, it's there are essentially no limits as to who can participate, and both from academia and private organizations. We also have international partner countries, uh, not uh, shown on this map, but we have people uh, represented from Australia and Canada, South Africa, uh, Caribbean Island, uh, and United States. And it's an, an open network and a growing network. So it's uh, possible to join uh, the work. If, for example, any of you attending here today uh, will be interested, you are more than welcome to, to either contact me or to go to the, the homepage innovat.eu to, to ask uh, or to uh, uh, subscribe to a working group. <clears throat> So that was uh, a bit about the, the frame for Innovat, but the, the aim of Innovat is, is written here. It is to optimize veterinary antimicrobial use with a special emphasis on the development of animal and disease specific treatment guidelines and refinement of microbiological diagnostic procedures. Combining this with a diverse educational activities, the action will contribute to build a larger critical mass of experts in veterinary antimicrobial stewardship throughout Europe. So a very long uh, aim, uh, as you can, can hear and see, but I try to highlight the important parts here. It's about development of treatment guidelines or practice guidelines for uh, antimicrobial use. It's about diagnostic procedures, uh, particularly development of cl clinical breakpoints, but also Malditov uh, criteria for uh, bacterial identification, and then about education. Uh, and cost actions are known to, uh, well, if you have a cost action, you need inclusiveness. So it's a lot about uh, including uh, young researchers, it's about uh, geographical diversity, and it's about gender equality, uh, gender balance. Um, so, so yeah, we have, uh, especially the educational activities, uh, training schools and so on, targeting the, uh, the young scientists. This is a per chart of the, the, the work being done by Innovat, the five working groups. And I will not uh, go into detail with, with all the different uh, uh, squares you can see here. Just highlight uh, some of them. Um, I'll see if I can get a pointer here. Um, working group one, we have, uh, I will go in, I will mention in a moment a survey we have uh, done on available treatment guidelines in Europe. And then I will mention some of the work we're doing in working group four to develop treatment guidelines, new treatment guidelines. And then I will uh, end up with some of the work from working group three on development of clinical breakpoints. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with antimicrobial treatment guidelines. So as probably most of you are aware, the quite a number of uh, treatment guidelines available, a lot of international treatment guidelines, some of which uh, you can see here. Books, it can be web pages, it can be, well, it could be anything, leaflets, it could be, uh, yeah, something uh, you can only imagine what it could be. But uh, some of the examples are shown here. And of course, these are broadly available and many of them are made by leading experts in, in the different fields. And they may be widely used. And because of that may also even establish consensus among vets about how to use uh, antibiotics for different purposes. So in many ways, uh, they're good, uh, but there are also some limitations and probably the most important of which is that they don't take into consideration local factors. And some of these are listed here. It can be local resistance patterns, local availability of antibiotics, but also uh, availability of diagnostic tools, local legislation, and even traditions and culture um, can also affect how uh, these may be used or the effectiveness of these international treatment guidelines. So therefore, in many ways, national treat treatment guidelines are preferable to the international ones. 
And I will just give one example uh, of a national treatment guideline, how it was made uh, using an example from, you can say my own uh, backyard uh, from, uh, from Denmark, where uh, I was the editor for the treatment guideline for um, uh, companion animals in Denmark. So this was some uh, work that started back in 2010, where the Danish veterinary organization wanted uh, a treatment guideline for companion animals, dogs and cats. And uh, they gathered a lot of experts from Denmark on different fields, so uh, an expert on urinary tract infections, uh, skin infections, and so on. And each of these experts had to write a chapter uh, for their own expert field, and then they would need an external reviewer to assess that everything was fine. And then I, as the editor, I tried to uh, glue it all together and, and make it into what was in the first edition of the, the, the treatment guideline. And it was highly inspired from the, the Swedish uh, National Guideline for Companion Animals at that time. That was uh, because that was one of the few ones available back then. Then five years later, we wanted to uh, make an update. So first we thought it would be a good idea to make a survey on how it had actually been used and if there was any impact on, on this treatment guideline. And this survey was conducted amongst uh, veterinary practitioners. And it showed that at least according to their response that there had been some impact, uh, that those who had actually used it and read it actually had a different practice towards use of antibiotics and in a good way, we would say. That was of course based on their responses, but we also could see from the Danish surveillance system, uh, DANMAP, that you may know, that the use of antibiotics had also changed in these uh, five years. That actually, the use of cephalosporins for companion animals had declined by two thirds uh, in that time. So based on all that, we uh, made an update using more or less the same approach, almost the same authors, told them to look at the available evidence, see if there was something new, and, and update the chapters. And I think also a new chapter was made uh, apart from that. And uh, you can see here, this is a Chinese version you can see on the right uh, here. And of course, we didn't decide to make it in Chinese from uh, the beginning, we made it in Danish. And then later we translated into uh, Chinese, Polish, Slovene and English based on requests uh, from, from other veterinary organizations. And, uh, and of course, we are, we are proud of this. We are, we are happy that it's being uh, widely adapted. But it's also, as I told you before, it's not necessarily a good thing uh, because Danish standards, Danish drugs are not the same as, not necessarily the same as in other countries. Of course, this may be better than nothing in some of the countries if no other guide exists, but it's not ideal. And at the same time, uh, this was, uh, you, can, you can question the approach we used for making the guideline. It was not, uh, well, it was our own uh, approach. This was what we thought would work. And I think we have a good guideline, but well, it was not a standardized systematic approach. And this uh, leads me to the next, uh, to the study uh, here of Enovat. This is a study by Horton Group One. Uh, looking at the available guidelines uh, in Europe for also for companion animals. I'm sorry, it's a lot about companion animals right now. I promise there will be more on food animals later. But, but this is a survey that was done uh, and published last year. And this survey uh, was to, to see what, is, what are these, uh, which guidelines exist, what is uh, how are they made? What is the structure? And, and what, can be, what can we learn from that? And here on the right, uh, maybe I should first acknowledge uh, Fergus Allerton. You can see in the lower left, he was uh, uh, from the UK. Dr. Fergus Allerton was in charge of this study. <clears throat> so uh, we exploited the network of Innovat. Uh, we had country representatives uh, who checked in their home country if uh, a national guideline existed and report it back. Uh, and then uh, we, we, well, we tried to see what was out there in Europe and also contacting people from other countries, not in Enovat. So 40 countries were contacted, uh, as you can see here. And then we had to uh, omit some of them uh, for not being, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, first of all, I would say we, we got a response uh, from uh, seven, 17 countries with the, uh, 
some sort of guidelines. And then afterwards, we had to uh, omit some of the available guidelines because various reasons were not eligible. Maybe they didn't provide uh, specific recommendations, but more of the overall general approach to uh, antimicrobial stewardship. So uh, we ended up with 15 guidelines from 10 countries. And these were evaluated both in an objective and a subjective way. And here are some of the results, some of the things were found from the evaluation, some of the objective results, you can say. Uh, it was shown that 11 of the 15 guidelines had suggested dosages, uh, 14 had tre uh, suggested treatment du durations, 11 had uh, potential adverse effects listed of antimicrobial use, and all of them actually showed uh, examples of when not to prescribe antimicrobials, because of course that's an important part of Stewardship, it is also to decide when it's not necessary. And then in this table here, you can actually see some of the uh, examples of, of when uh, antimicrobials should not be used, at least in some of the recommendations here. For example, acute diarrhea in dogs, uh, something that all of them recommended not to use, whereas another uh, indication, subclinical bacteriuria, uh, was something only approximately half of them recommended. <clears throat> And I can just mention uh, when it comes to treatment duration, uh, urinary tract infection in dogs, uh, recommendations was anything from three to 14 days for sporadic uh, urinary tract infections, infection. And of course, this uh, is, a, is a big uh, change, a big difference between the highest and lowest uh, duration. And we could see that the newest guidelines uh, were those with the shortest durations recommended, just showing that over time, recommendations actually change. <clears throat> so the authors uh, raised some concerns based on this uh, survey. First of all, uh, relatively few countries in Europe had national guidelines. Um, none of them were initiated, were initiated by governmental initiatives. They were all by other initiatives. Uh, could be from veterinary organizations or something else, but not from governments. There were large differences in, in the structure and recommendations. Uh, anything from leaflets to uh, books were published. Uh, there was a general failure to declare the evidence base and conflicts of interest. And then there was not enough follow-up on implementation and effects of offense microbial use. So uh, it was concluded that the study provided a framework highlighting some of the fundamental stewardship principles that should be integral to future stewardship guidelines and that a greater awareness of the need to use a structured approach to guideline development could improve the quality of such guidelines in the future. And this structured approach is actually what is uh, uh, central for Working Group 4 of Innovat, because Working Group 4 has the objectives you can see here. First of all, to draft a standard for veterinary practice guidelines, and this has actually been done already and available on this link you can see here on how to make these guidelines. And remember here, I call them practice guidelines uh, because it's not only about treatment, it's also about how to handle uh, animals with uh, infections in a broader context. To write high quality species and disease specific uh, veterinary practice guidelines in a structured and transparent process. And here, again, I highlight it should be a structured but also a transparent way it should be made. And then promote these uh, innovative guidelines into national or local guidelines. And this is uh, work uh, being done in collaboration with different uh, organizations. We have the ESCMED study, study group for veterinary microbiology the World Small Animal uh, Veterinary Association, and then also the International Society for Companion Animal Infectious Diseases being involved. The organization of the work is uh, shown here. Uh, on the top left, you can see Lisbeth Remiesten, who is uh, the chair of Working Group 4 and coordinating uh, all the work. And um, she is chair, you can say, of seven drafting groups you can see uh, and, uh, uh, below here. So the drafting groups uh, are post weaning diarrhea, bovine mastitis, bovine respiratory disease, poultry coli bacillosis, surgical prophylaxis and hygiene, 
canine acute diarrhea and canine uh, pyoderma. So each of these uh, groups, I have to make some recommendations uh, for, for these uh, different infections and so on. And uh, they're not just let loose uh, doing their own thing. They are under the control, you can say, of a methodology task force uh, led by Lu Dr. Luis Carmo. Um, and this task force is, made, is established to ensure that it's done in the same way, in a structured way. Uh, yeah. How, how did we select these topics? Well, they were based on, on the criteria you can see below. Amount and critical importance of antimicrobials used for treatment of the disease condition. Potential to impact animal and public health uh, from antimicrobial use. And then lack of similar European guidelines. And I think you can all uh, realize that, for example, in, in, in uh, cattle, mastitis and respiratory infections are some of the most important uh, infections requiring antimicrobial treatment. <clears throat> so the persons involved in each of these drafting groups uh, were carefully selected by the leaders uh, to have complementing expertise, uh, both pharmacology and microbiology, but also clinical uh, clinicians were important or are important, had to fill out transparency declarations to make sure that uh, it's, it's all clear uh, what, what is their interest and what is their work. And then uh, the group should include animal owners. Uh, so not just uh, scientists necessarily, but also animal owners, for example, farmers, uh, small animal owners and so on. Uh, I don't think any of the groups have them involved at this point, uh, but they will uh, have to be involved according to the process later when the guidelines are uh, being uh, evaluated. So this is the process uh, you can see here of um, the guideline development. And uh, sorry, it's a little bit blurry, but, uh, but I'll just guide you through what we're doing. First of all, in, initially, uh, the groups had to, all the seven groups had to make foreground questions on management and interventions of infection. So to raise all the questions of what do we want to achieve? Uh, what, what do we want to, where do we want to make an intervention and, and so on? Uh, the questions raised then had to be reviewed. And for first, they prepared a protocol together with this methodology task force to make the right search uh, strings and so on. And then this is where we are now. Uh, the groups are making reviews of the evidence pertaining to these questions. And then finally, uh, which will be by the end of this year and next year, this uh, these reviews will then be used in something called the grade approach, which is, uh, you can see down below here, grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation. And this is a systematic approach uh, used previously for human treatment guidelines, but now for the first time for veterinary uh, guidelines, uh, where the evidence for different recommendations are rated uh, as good, moderate, or low. Direction of the recommendation, are we for or against? Um, this recommendation, and then the strength of recommendation uh, is also uh, evaluated. And finally, uh, after this great process, the guidelines should be ready. And uh, just to mention that it's okay that uh, not everyone in a drafting group agrees, but it will be transparent, it will be evident uh, from the final recommendations if there is some disagreement in the groups. Uh, finally, just want to mention here uh, that these uh, reviews will be available, uh, as I said, later this year or next year, and then the guidelines will follow in, in separate, um, I think, articles. Everything to be published in the veterinary journal. So, uh, so look out uh, when when they arrive. Finally, uh, we want to take these a little bit further because these are European, we call them treatment guidelines uh, from European stakeholders. But we also want to make them national. We want to help uh, countries to adapt these general recommendations and make them into national uh, treatment guidelines. And of course, it's a European initiative, but it's something that could go beyond. Uh, so, so I would just say that this is something that uh, hopefully can have an impact uh, beyond Europe. 
Okay, and I can see time is running fast, but I will uh, hopefully um, uh, not go too much uh, over my uh, 30 minutes. I will uh, jump to the next point, which is clinical breakpoints, which is uh, <clears throat> MIC values or uh, zone diameters used by diagnostic laboratories to catch grass uh, susceptibility testing results as either susceptible, intermediate, or resistant. So whether or not you can treat an animal uh, based on diagnostic tests, uh, treat with antibiotics. Such uh, clinical breakpoints should be specific for animal species, infection site, bacterial species, and the dosage you intend to use. Just an example here, we have a breakpoint here. It's for Pastorella multocida from respiratory infections in cattle uh, for fluorophenicol. And here the breakpoint is uh, MIC uh, below or equal to one milligram per liter, means that uh, an isolate Pastorella is susceptible to this drug. So just highlighting, we have the bacterial species, the infection, animal, drug, and the dosage. And uh, I think in the interest of time, I think I will go quickly through this is a bit out on how breakpoints are defined uh, using the VETCAST approach. I'm chair of VETCAST, which is a UCAST uh, veterinary subcommittee uh, for susceptibility testing. And this is the approach uh, used to make clinical breakpoints. You need three uh, cutoff values, MIC cutoff values, and essentially based on these, you decide on the clinical breakpoint. Um, and instead of explaining a whole lot about uh, what these cutoff values are, I'll just mention that it's actually a lot of data needed to create them, a lot of MIC data, pharmacokinetic data from animal trials, and, and so on. So the internationally recognized clinical breakpoints existing, well, it's not a lot uh, we have. We have, uh, I would say, in my view, uh, what I know of, uh, at least, is the CLSI uh, breakpoints that you can see here. This is the latest edition, as I recall, VET01S. Um, they also have other documents, CLSI, but they're not, uh, the breakpoints there are not, as uh, you can say, validated as the ones in, in this VET01S document. Uh, VETCAST is also working on clinical breakpoints. Currently, you have one for fluorophenicol, and we are working uh, in progress to create other clinical breakpoints. So this uh, table you can see here on the right, it shows uh, the available clinical breakpoints in veterinary medicine for, uh, from CLSI. And uh, you can see on the top uh, row here, you can see the different animal species. And then you can see on the left, you can see the different uh, antibiotics for which breakpoints exist. And then you can see in, in the actual table uh, which target pathogens and which infections these breakpoints are directed at. <clears throat> and I think it's pretty clear that uh, there are some gaps. So uh, some of all the empty fields means that there's, there is no breakpoint for this uh, animal species. For example, for cat and cifpodoxum, it's empty, meaning no clinical breakpoint. And in some cases, it makes sense <clears throat> because some of the drugs are specific for more or less only used in, in some animals, for example, go down to some of these. Uh, to lastromycin, for example, is not used for companion animals. So it makes sense we don't have breakpoints for, for those, uh, but instead for, for production animals, uh, food animals. But in other cases, well, we need the breakpoint. So what do we do when we have a situation where a breakpoint is missing? Can we just use another breakpoint or what? And this is a, it's not a super easy answer uh, or question to, to answer. I will just mention that it can create problems. And I have an example here uh, illustrating this. So here you can see uh, part of this CLSI breakpoint table, you can see uh, on the top here, we have a breakpoint table for um, Pastorella multocida in cattle. And below here, uh, we have a table for Actinobacillus blow pneumonia in, in pigs. And the table here, the tables above, uh, actually show breakpoints for tulastromycin against respiratory infections, both for cattle and for pigs. And this, they, but at the same time, they also show different breakpoints. So here uh, you can see the breakpoints for distribution 
what corresponds to susceptible, intermediate, or resistant is not the same as you see in, in pigs. So cattle and pigs are, are different. So this means that, for example, if you have a zone diameter of 12 millimeter when you test susceptibility to, uh, to lastromycin, uh, pastorella multocida would be resistant if it's from cattle, but uh, if it's an actinobacillus pneumonia, it would be susceptible. So in other words, uh, you can say this is fine. I mean, now we have the breakpoint, so why care about this? But just imagine if we didn't have the breakpoint for, for example, cattle, uh, there would be a risk if we just used the, the pick breakpoint that uh, we would have it false um, susceptible and we would treat uh, with a, an antibiotic when it was not possible. And that's a situation that you risk when you use breakpoints from other animal species or other infections. So what to do when you lack a clinical breakpoint? Um, well, what you saw is actually one of the possibilities to use a clinical breakpoint for another animal species, but also it could be for another bacterial species in the same animal, another infection site for humans. Uh, it could be an ACOF. It could also be uh, for another dosage, although that's not really recommended because these breakpoints are highly specific for a certain dosage. Actually, the best thing would be to report no interpretation if you lack a specific clinical breakpoint. But of course, uh, we're not really interested in that. It's diagnostic labs, we want to report a result. And I just want to highlight here, uh, again, CLSI has made a document called the VET09, giving some general recommendations and suggestions on what to do when a breakpoint is lacking. Uh, also highlighting some of the caveats uh, of, uh, of doing so. So this is at least one uh, way to go where you can see what would be recommended in, in a specific situation. But even that document uh, has no real solution. So we need to develop new clinical breakpoints. And here, uh, one of my last slides is just uh, to highlight that VET CAST is, is working towards new clinical breakpoints. Of course, CLSI is also continuously doing that, but I'm not from CLSI, so I cannot uh, mention too much about what they are actually doing or planning. Uh, VETCAST is prioritizing clinical breakpoints in, in different ways. Of course, we are looking at the data gaps. Where do we have the, the gaps in the table? Um, what is highly needed? What would be have a big impact if we made a breakpoint here? Um, but we also have to be realistic and look at what do we have data for or funding for, because it's expensive to make breakpoints. And VETCAST is not funded in any way, uh, except for donations or whatever we can attract, uh, but it's not, it doesn't have a basic uh, funding um, for anything. So we have to look at data being available already, uh, or we have to, to design new research. And then of course, we also have to consider what we have the expertise for, uh, because it's not always that easy to make clinical breakpoints for, for animals. Uh, because we have to consider other things. Uh, we have to consider flock treatment, we, uh, which is, of course, not a thing in, in human medicine, uh, and, and so on. There are a few things that are different uh, in veterinary medicine. We collect and we produce data, uh, pharmacokinetic data from animal trials, MIC data, um, and then we model data. PKBD modeling, and then we make the PKBD breakpoints and then uh, decide on, on the clinical breakpoints in the end. And this work is done in collaboration again with Enovat, uh, this time the working group three. And you can say there's a lot of overlap between VETCAST and, and this working group, uh, some of the same people being involved. But uh, Enovat has a ca capability to also fund uh, training schools so we have, uh, Innovat has made a training school. This is what you can see here, a picture from Padova last year, uh, where we had uh, just over 20 uh, people attending a training school on basic PKBD. Uh, so one of the quite important topics to, to make uh, breakpoints, for example. Working group three of Innovat has also made a survey uh, to ask what breakpoints would actually be or needed or wanted by end users. So clinicians or uh, microbiologists from diagnostic labs and, and so on. And I will just end up with the results here. 
because this is uh, it's not yet published, but this is what came out of this survey. Uh, because one thing is what a little steering committee wants in terms of uh, breakpoints. Uh, another thing is what the wider community would like for, for breakpoints. Uh, and here you can see results for cattle and pigs. So for cattle, first of all, there was a demand for uh, breakpoints for respiratory tract infections and mastitis. And for pigs, uh, mainly for gastrointestinal infections and uh, respiratory infections. And here you can see uh, the two uh, figures here. You can see what drugs, uh, which drugs they, uh, the respondents would like breakpoints for. You can see both for uh, pigs, but also for cattle, the two most wanted drugs are sulfur uh, trimethoprim uh, combinations and penicillin. And uh, this is actually, uh, well, it's understandable because sulfur TMP is something for which there are no veterinary breakpoints at all. So whenever you test for sulfur TMP susceptibility uh, using a veterinary isolate, it would be a human breakpoint. So yes, it's, uh, I understand why it's in demand, but it's also complex because it's a combination uh, and there's a synergy between the two drugs. So it's not very easy to make a breakpoint uh, for this uh, combination, but it's uh, at least we have noted, or hopefully we'll publish it and maybe we'll have the time and, and uh, the funding to, to use, uh, or to work on such breakpoints. Also for gastrointestinal infections in pigs, it's interesting because there are no uh, breakpoints for gastrointestinal infections. It can actually be considered topical treatment almost because you take a pill or you, you ingest uh, powder, whatever, and then it ends up directly where the pathogens are. And actually, uh, this is not a typical, uh, you can say, way. Uh, normally, it's for systemic use of uh, antibiotics when we make clinical breakpoints. So this is also something new uh, that we need to uh, have a look at if we can make breakpoints for gastrointestinal infections. OK, and VETCAST is, of course, the European uh, initiative under, the, under UCAST. Uh, but again, I would like to emphasize here that uh, it's not a closed group, a European group. It's a, something anyone can contribute to. And probably a lot of you know already that UCAST is also expanding worldwide. And VETCAST, I don't see any reason why VETCAST cannot do so also. So if anyone is interested, uh, we are all, all, always uh, open for people interested in collaborating providing data, um, helping with modeling of data, providing input, uh, expert input or questions on some certain topic, but also for teaching, uh, we, we can, of course, uh, consider people from outside Europe. And of course, when our breakpoints become available, they can be used anywhere, as long as the protocol and guidelines of VETCAST are followed. And I think that's it from me. And I apologize for going a little bit over time, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Peter. It was excellent. And uh, you made it, uh, I think many colleagues, both clinicians and working on regulatory aspects, for example, could relate with many of the aspects that, uh, that you raised. And you opened some interesting doors for collaborations in the future. So thank you very much for that. We have several questions, we have about two minutes for questions. Uh, we'll try to address uh, most of them, and if not, as we said in the beginning, the materials will be shared on the field channels, and uh, we'll follow up by email on the questions that we cannot address in the webinar. One of the first questions that came in was, if you could please um, clarify the relationship between, if there's any, between ENOVAT and the, the, the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute, the CLSI, if ENOVAT is affiliated with the CLSI. No, it's, it's not. Uh, so you can say Innovat uh, is about, um, uh, well, we have the working group three working on uh, clinical breakpoints, as I mentioned. And uh, you can say actually originally Innovat was, uh, uh, the idea came from Betcast that we wanted to, to make uh, a cost action. And then it was just broadened into something with treatment guidelines and so on. So that's, it's based on, based on an initiative from, uh, from Betcast. But it doesn't, of course, exclude uh, CLSI. So, I mean, uh, VETCAST in general, but also Innovat uh, is interested in collaborating with CLSI. Uh, and we, we have contact, uh, I have contact with Mark Pepich and other people uh, from CLSI 
uh, we regularly uh, interact. Uh, but of course, it's they do their work and we do our work, but every now and then we exchange uh, views and so on. Okay, thank you very much. Then we have a, a, a question very uh, that many clinicians face in the, the field. Uh, if, if there's any guideline when you should, about when you should switch to a second or antibiotic, meaning you are treating, for example, a respiratory tract infection, you tried with the first antibiotic of your choice, and then it didn't work. Uh, so the colleague was wondering if there's, if you came across guidelines on when should I switch or should I try something else? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And actually, I, I sometimes wonder myself uh, because I, we have in Denmark a, a treatment guideline for horses where we have a first, second and third choice. And I sometimes wonder when do you ever select the third choice? But, um, but I would say, uh, I, First of all, I am not aware of the specific guideline because as they can be made in many different ways. But in general, uh, I would say a second choice would be if you have tried before uh, treating an animal uh, with uh, the first choice and you uh, have you've seen it didn't respond and you want to treat it empirically uh, again, then uh, I think then you can argue, OK, maybe I should use a second choice because the first choice didn't work. Uh, you can also say if it's a if it's an animal that uh, is from, a, I mean, it has an unknown uh, treatment background, uh, you can also say, okay, well, we know it's been treated uh, many times, it failed. Uh, so maybe we should go a little bit higher this time. Uh, but it could also be a seriously ill animal. It could be an animal that uh, where you, you cannot, a failure is not an option, a highly valuable animal maybe. And then it would be uh, worthwhile to, to go with the second or third choice, uh, which would usually be more broad spectrum are more uh, critically important. But I don't think there's a clear definition, uh, but actually it's maybe some one of the things that should be more clear from, from the guidelines actually when you can go for that. I think this is an important point. All right, thank you very much, Peter. There's, there's some questions that several uh, colleagues asked uh, if uh, the CLSI guidelines are available for public download. My impression is that they aren't. But can you please clarify if uh, the colleagues the colleagues that are interested in downloading them, the last question that you presented, are they publicly available or not? Well, they are. Uh, I I think the, they are not. Uh, it's not. It's not easy to find them. But actually, you can uh, go uh, to the CLSI homepage, and then you can. Uh, you, I'm not sure you can download them as such uh, as a PDF, but you can actually go page by page and see the recommendations, which is a little bit tedious, uh, but I think that should be possible. Uh, but I, I would recommend that you uh, contact the CLSI uh, to, to get that information. But, but certainly, actually, after Vetcast uh, started uh, some years back, they, this was actually a criticism of CLSI, that it was only available for purchase. And then since then, to my understanding, it has been available. All right. So good news in terms of... Uh access and uh, public uh, availability. Uh, a couple of questions on alternatives. If you if you have come across, if there are guidelines for any alternatives to antimicrobials in the treatment of animal species. So guidelines for alternatives to antimicrobials, if you have any experience on this or availability on them. Mm, well, I'm not sure I have a guideline specifically on alternatives. Uh, I'm, I'm, at least I'm not aware of that, uh, but I think uh, definitely guidelines, like I mentioned before, uh, that they should, uh, as I wrote, uh, as I mentioned before, that 15 out of 15 guidelines had examples of when not to use antibiotic treatment. And they should, uh, of course, also mention what could be done instead. Uh, and I know for, for our Danish uh, guideline for companion animals, uh, for example, acute diarrhea, I think we've listed six or seven other alternative options uh, on what to do when you face an animal with this uh, problem. Uh, so we don't just say, don't, don't treat with antibiotics and then find information elsewhere. So I, I hope that uh, most other guidelines do the same, but I, I'm not aware and I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, specific guidelines for completely alternative treatment. All right, great. There are several colleagues, which is wonderful to see. Many colleagues are interested in further collaboration and uh, also engaging in teaching and research. So uh, you mentioned that the uh, colleagues can join via the, the website that you mentioned, and we will share the presentation. And at the end, we will also share the contact information if colleagues want to 
follow up. So that's uh, that's very good to see. That's the purpose of the um, one of the purpose of this uh, webinar. Um, a question from a colleague that is mentioning that he, they are monitoring the prevalence of resistant commensal E. coli from dairy cow feces through microbrothylution method. Can they use the UCAS clinical breakpoint? Ooh, the UCAS uh, clinical breakpoint. Well, that would be uh, then for for human. Um, uh, infections and actually, um, well, you can use whatever breakpoint uh, you want. I mean, uh, you can say you can argue here that if it's a commensal, it's not for. Uh, I mean, you're not talking clinical uh, treatment anyway, so it doesn't matter so much if it's a veterinary or human breakpoint. I think the most important thing is that you're, whenever you publish something, that you're very transparent about the breakpoints you use and mention why did you use these and not those. I think for surveillance, in many cases, the uh, ECOS, the epidemiological cutoffs, would be a, a good choice because it shows uh, distinguishes between wild type and non-wild type. And I think uh, that, uh, for at least for surveillance purposes, would be a good choice. And that's, you can say, universal. That's not between uh, veterinary and human. Thank you, Peter. One is, is uh, sometimes there's confusion on this, and I think you can uh, help all of us clarify this point. What is the relationship between the clinical breakpoint and the and Timakova susceptibility testing? So these are two words that we use a lot and we hear a lot. If you could clarify what do they mean or how they are related, the, 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 determining the clinical breakpoint and when we speak about Timakova susceptibility testing. Mm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you repeat it? Or I mean, the relationship between clinical breakpoint and susceptibility testing? Yeah, that is yeah. The, 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 the question. Okay, uh, I, I, I will try uh, to answer. But, but um, I mean, you do susceptibility testing, you get an MIC, you get a disk diffusion zone diameter, and, and that you need to interpret. Uh, of course, you can say one is lower than uh than 18 and then something uh, but but what does it mean so you need some of these limits uh, to define whether it's susceptible or, or resistant or intermediate meaning that you could probably increase the dosage and, and have an efficiency so that's there's sort of yeah we can say borders of when is uh, on how you can interpret your results but uh, but it's a good question and uh, it's something i think a lot of people uh, i mean i i know personally uh, vets uh, who do their own, uh, for example, distribution in, in their own practice, and then they look at the zone diameter of the plate, and they see, okay, there's a large uh, zone diameter, okay, it's susceptible, and a small zone diameter or no uh, inhibition zone, then it's resistant. And, and this is something, uh, I mean, uh, that <laughs> you can say it makes sense intuitively. Uh, the more inhibition, the more efficient the antibiotic is. But it's just not good enough. You need uh, because it doesn't correlate to necessarily uh, what happens in the animal. You need some breakpoints, and also the needs. I mean, it could depend on the strength of the disc you use on the disc diffusion. So you really need to use some breakpoints when you want to use it for guiding treatment. Okay, very good. Um, one is is uh, you come across these different guidelines, and uh, a colleague is asking. Okay, so there's these different possibilities and which standard to use when performing antimicrobial resistance surveillance, the OCAST and, or the CLSI and why? So that, that might be a question that comes up, uh, like we know the options, uh, which ones to use uh, and why? Yeah, I think again, it depends on the, the scope of the surveillance. Uh, I think if it's, um, when we talk surveillance of uh, indicator bacteria, again, it could be, you can use epidemiological cutoffs. And then I think those that you can find publicly available are from UCAS, but they, in theory, they should be universal. They shouldn't be different uh, between organizations. But when it comes to clinical breakpoints, I would say, um, I mean, the only validated clinical breakpoints uh, are those from CLSI. When we talk about animal in, uh, infectious agents, about animal bacteria. So I would say then use those whenever they are available. But then the problem is if you have, uh, let's say you have a uh, E. coli uh, from 
whatever, pick uh, feces, uh, for example, uh, from, uh, from an infections from uh, diarrhea and pigs, and you want to make uh, a table of, of resistance. I mean, I just faced that. Uh, we made something similar uh, just a few days ago for the Danish surveillance, the Denmark report. We have uh, 150 clinical E. coli from pigs, uh, diarrhea. And then we want to publish resistance uh, data. And uh, it's not easy because you don't have a breakpoint for, first of all, as I said, we don't have any enteric breakpoints at all. So we have to use other breakpoints uh, from veterinary side. But sometimes we don't even have a veterinary breakpoint. Uh, if it's from a, you know, some drugs are only for human use, then we have to use a human clinical breakpoint or an ECOF. And it's actually, I, I don't have a, a, you can say, a universal idea of uh, what is the best approach, except to write what breakpoints you actually used. Uh, and then, uh, and especially if you want to compare data to previous years, like we are doing, then you have to calculate it in the same way. Or if you want to compare between studies, be very careful, uh, because often when you compare between studies, breakpoints are different so it's uh, a lot of uh, potential risks of uh, of over or under interpreting uh, data yeah i know it's not a, it's not a very clear answer but it's also a very complex area exactly. and since we have a global audience um the question is are the guidelines that you you have been mentioning location independent that is can the same guideline be applied in any region? And this is particularly relevant if we are, this is a global webinar. So I think you mentioned this in your presentation, but could you please clarify this? If there's guidelines in one region, can or should they be applied in another region of the, the world? I think if it, when it comes to the, the Innovat guidelines that we are making now, um, I mean, they are, they, we call them European guidelines because it's a European initiative and most of the people working on it are European, but they don't look for European literature. I mean, they look for literature at the reviews right now across the world. And they also have experts from outside Europe. So these guidelines, when they become available for these uh, specific infections, infections, post weaning diarrhea and pigs and uh, cattle respiratory infections and, and so on, then they can be applied anywhere uh, and be you can say adapted into uh, national guidelines. Then the principles of those can be taken and used to make national guidelines. Uh, so, but but of course, if, if a certain drug is, is recommended and it's not available in, in your country, well, then uh, you would need to, of course, adapt it uh, and maybe uh, consult with those who made the guidelines and ask if it's not clear what could be another option for treatment here. Great. Thank you, Peter. A question on some, some these two words sometimes get mixed. And uh, if you could please clarify the difference between a clinical breakpoint and uh, the ECOF, the epidemiological cutoff, and uh, when do we exactly should use each one of them? I think this is a, a question I doubt that many colleagues have. So if you could please use this time to clarify that. OK. Yeah, so an ECOF is, uh, is uh, well, maybe I should, uh, I actually omitted a slide on this because I thought it was a bit too complex. Maybe I should have uh, included it as a backup slide. But anyway, uh, an ECOF is, uh, is uh, defining the upper end of the, the wild type population. So population of bacteria without uh, acquired persistence. Uh, so the, the highest MIC you have amongst the wild type without this acquired resistance, uh, these phenotypically detectable phenotypic resistance, that's it, the ECOF. So it's very, uh, you can say, well, uh, it's not based on, on anything uh, related to how the drug is absorbed and, and how uh, it reaches a certain infection site and, and so on. So that's, uh, you can use it for surveillance. You can say, well, it's resistant or not resistant. It's acquired resistance or not. Um, but a clinical breakpoint is something that's uh, supposed to guide treatment of infections. Uh, so therefore you need to know, I mean, one thing is that it's, uh, let's say it's susceptible according to an ECOF, okay? So if it's susceptible according to an ECOF, it's a wild type organism, fine. Uh, but, but let's say if it's not absorbed from the gut, and you want to treat it as a, a respiratory infection, then it doesn't matter if it's susceptible according to the ECOF, uh, then uh, you cannot use it anyway. So it's resistant according to the clinical breakpoint, 
because it takes into account the absorption, the distribution, elimination, and all sorts of other things that uh, are not taken into account uh, by any cough. And this is also why the clinical breakpoints have to be specific for animals and so on, because different animals have different rates of absorption and, and uh, other pharmacokinetic traits. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. And uh, we are very thankful for all the, the, the questions that the, the colleagues uh, posted uh, that reflects the interest on these topics. And we, we will not, unfortunately, be able to address all of them, uh, policies in advance for that, but we can follow up by email. And uh, Peter is available, we are available to make the, the further connections. The last question before we close up is on the, the um, you mentioned that one of the conclusions, if I understood correctly, was on the, the lack, the, there is these guidelines, but then there's a, still a lack on the follow-up, on the actual implementation of the guidelines. And even more than that, the, the actual effect on the different antimicrobial use. So the question would be, is there any planned um, work on the, to, to cover these this gaps, the, the, the implementation gap of some of the guidelines that you came across, and if they actually are reflected on the a different antimicrobial use in BT in quantity or the different uh, classes used, if there's any uh, planned work on these aspects? Um, I guess it's about the Innovat guidelines, so yes, about yes. implementation of those. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, I'm afraid uh, we, we are running out of time when it comes to Innovat also, uh, because uh, we have until uh, the end of next year. So we have still one and a half year almost uh, to complete the, the reviews ongoing and the guidelines. And the plan is uh, in, the, in the objectives is also to try and implement the guidelines in, uh, in con I mean, you can say in countries that don't have uh, guidelines. So, so we will help with that. It's a bit diffusely described in the application in the memorandum of understanding. But that's certainly the plan. So, um, so hopefully next year, and actually we have a possibility to extend the action uh, half a year. So maybe with a bit of luck, we have two years left. Hopefully we can uh, we can once the guidelines are ready, uh, try and 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 help to move them a bit forward. Because one thing is to have a European and uh, innovate guideline, but it I mean you want we really want to implement them. We want to have, to make them work. Uh, I mean. It's not just a publication to us. It's also something that we want to be used. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. So it's to so not any concrete, not any specific plans, but certainly something that we will aim to do. Probably, I would say, uh, in a year's time from now, we'll start considering that because hopefully by then, most of these uh, treatment guidelines should be available. Excellent. So thank you, Peter, for your presentation and for this fruitful discussion and all the, the collaborations that all your clarification. I think it was very useful to some uh, common understanding of terminology of the concepts and, and the work that you... Congratulations to all the network colleagues that have been working hard. And as you said, this is a network, so you, have, you all have to put your own time to come up with these answers and find funding for the work that you do. So uh, I think we, as a technical community, we all can be thankful for the work that you are doing. So thank you for your participation on this. And just before we uh, close up, just sharing what's coming up for next. So this webinar, the Knowledge Dissemination Dialogues are uh, organized always in the second uh, Thursday of the month. And so the next one is uh, 11th August, and it will be on antifungal resistance in agriculture by the colleague Lawrence Goodrich based on the University of Guelph in uh, Canada. So at the same time, the lunchtime in the Central European and August 12th, also the, the second Thursday. And uh, many colleagues expressed interest in following up on uh, uh, different topics. So you can always reach us via this antimicrobial slash uh, um, hyphen resistance at fao.org uh, to, if you have speakers or any other uh, suggestion, we'll be happy to take them on board. So thank you all, and we'll follow up in the FAO channel. Thank you.